back there behind us. But now we're uh, we're still. I think we we're gonna approach some of those places a little bit later. But right now you can kind of see where the path is going, so that's good enough. All right, it's still pretty muddy and everything. But if you look, like this is what we're like in the middle of the rain, Grenada rainforest. These trails are what the Maroons used to take. These are the trails that Fedon and his rebellion, they used to take these paths. A slave revolt. All right, this is Dr. V's revolution would not be pesticides. And now uh, this video is gonna be more specifically about Grenada Maroons. Now, Grenada Maroons, I mean, we typically tend to hear about Jamaica Maroons, Brazil, Brazil's Maroons, Suriname's Maroons. Grenada's Maroon community was a very small Maroon community. But I decided to do a video on this because I like to do sometimes do the videos on things that are not so popular. But at the same time, that's where my mom is from, and I just visited there. So I was in the woods, and I got to see all the Maroon trails and all that stuff. So I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, oh, before we get started, check this out. I got this shirt here, Cimarron. It was created by my friend, Dr. Kino Miller. And uh, Dr. Kino Miller, he has drkinomiller.com, where he's a, he's a psychologist. He deals with psychology, history, um, sports, and he's a complete package. Really, really good brother. He knows a lot of information about all that stuff. And I'm telling you guys, check it out. But it says here, let the ancestors speak. And then he has the... Uh, the Ogun symbol here, I believe that is, of the Haitian Vev. All right, Ogun is the god of war, by the way. But before we get started, let's let's go take a look here. Um, I was in uh, the archives in London in the year 2015, and by studying Dominica, which was my dissertation was on, Dominica and, and Grenada were under the same government, and so I got a lot of Grenadian information. When I went to Grenada's archives, I wasn't really able to get that much information there at all when it came to like 18th century history. But in London, I was able to get a lot. So I went back through my my uh, records and I was able to find a lot of information that was very useful. If you look here, um, this is the uh, this is this is an example of what one of the books would have looked like. The cover it says Grenada. And then it says the account of uh, sales in the Seated Islands. And I think that's what that says. And then it says, um, you go down here, a lot of this information is in French. Um, but this, this particular one right here uh, talks about like the maroon slaves, the runaway slaves being in the parish of St. Andrews. And how they there were over a hundred of them, and then they sent a detachment of troops out there, and the detachment of troops surrounded these hundred Africans, and a lot of the Africans ended up fleeing um, after they sent the, the the detachment out there to surround them. But um, this is, it, I mean, the the curse of handwriting in those days is, is a little bit difficult to read, but there's a that's why it's important, like I said in one of my other videos, to read cursive as well as to read in other languages because that's what you're going to end up coming across when you're in the archives and you want to piece together a story here. But what I ended up doing is I took a lot of this information and I transcribed it into print. And this is what you have here. Um, so the Grenada records were in the archives in Kew Gardens in London and they were under Colonial Office Papers 101 slash two and also colonial office papers well there, there were in other areas as well but the ones where i got a lot of maroon information was in colonial colonial office papers 101 slash two and also colonial office papers 101 slash four so i'm going to go through this real quick see what we can find here it says grenada october 13 1763 and i'm going to go through i'm not going to read the whole thing to you but i'm going to read what i have emboldened in the past that mentions maroons in grenada Right here, this paragraph, it says, I have the satisfaction to inform the Lordship that since my last 
the chief of the maroon slaves have been mostly either killed or being taken, have suffered exemplary punishments in consequence of which many of these less guilty have returned to their masters, so that such are still in the woods, are becoming, or are become fallen numbers, I think that's that should say. And I have a lot of spaces here, blanks here, for the parts that I either couldn't read or the parts that fell into the crease of the book. Um, and for the present, little formidable, their entire reduction is a point which shall blah, 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 blah. All right, so that's that, right? So in 1766, it looks like, and, I, and towards the end of the year, the, the, the Maroons, many of whom, according to the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, if we go right over to here, many of these Maroons, let's look, 1763 is when most of them start, most Africans are starting to be imported. And they start to go on the rise right here, 1766. A large influx of Africans comes in, comes in in that year. So that makes sense that there would be a large number of Maroons because the more Africans you're importing from the continent, the more likely you are to have people that are banding together and looking to escape because these are freeborn people. And it looks like the majority of them are actually coming from either the Gold Coast and the Bidabi Afro. You Gold Coast, those are the people you're of present-day Ghana, your tree-speaking people, your Akan, your Koromanti, your Ashanti, your Fanti, your Akwamu, your Dentia, those are your Kwakus, your Kwashis, your Kwaminas, your Kwamis, your Kojos, your all the Kujo, all that stuff, right? These are where, where I found out my ancestors, ancestors come from. I'm actually going to do a video on that later on. Next, by the Biafra, 3,577. This is where your your ports of Bani, Calabar, New Calabar, Southeast Nigeria. This is where the majority of your Igbo people come from. Your Igbo people were also notorious for running away from slavery in large numbers. So if you look through the late 1760s, you see a large influx of Africans coming in from these two regions. Your Ashanti or your Akan or your Koromanti, the ones from the Gold Coast, they were also not notable and, and notorious for being a very formidable, warrior-like group of people who were very organized, right? Your Jamaican Maroons were mostly, uh, most of the leaders were of Ashanti background. Your Suriname Maroons were mostly of Akan background from the Gold Coast. Your, um, just a number of Maroon communities in the British West Indies and in the Dutch West Indies have backgrounds with the Akan. All right, so let's go on to the next page here in the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. 1770. It looks like the Gold Coast starts to increase their numbers compared to the Bada Biafra. Uh, you have 1,644 in 1770, and you have 2,174 from the Gold Coast in 1771. They even say a, lo a lot of the Maroons were in St. Andrew in the forest. And a lot of these Maroons, they, I mean, they, they call the, uh, the mountain the highest point in that area where the Maroons live. They call it Mount Kwakwa. And uh, I think according to Cor Curtis Jacobs, the word Kwakwa is in a, is a, it's an Akan word. It's a tree word, and I think it means forest. Uh, and that would make a little bit of sense because a lot of the Africans, as you can see, according to the database, right around that time when the Maroons were building their community, 1770, a lot of them here were coming from the Gold Coast. So it is likely that they might have give, they might have been the ones giving them the name, giving that area of the woods that name, Kwa Kwa. All right, so let's go on a little further here. Uh, not going to read everything. Just scroll down. Scroll down. Got a little caracou. It says here the maroon slaves have lately committed some outrages, but they have regret. They have again dispersed. So this is. This is months later. So it seems like they thought the numbers had dwindled, but now the, the Maroons are coming back. This is January 16th, 1767. Uh, the bill is now ready to pass the council empowering the commander-in-chief to order out the mulattoes and free Negroes and even those white inhabitants when necessary and that a mulatto bill is also under the consideration of the House of Assembly. I hope in a short time these, runaway, these runaways will be totally suppressed. In the meantime, my lord, as idle reports may possibly be spread on the present occasion, I think it my duty, blah, 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 blah. All right, so they're saying they're looking for a bill to help suppress these runaways. Uh, let's go a little further. This, this gives a lot of the information on the, um, 
basically like it's like a census of you know what's going on how many people are on the island how many children how many blacks how many whites but it says here there are about 50 runaway negroes that are recorded all right now in the french document that we looked at earlier it said there were there were 100 fugitives so they were basically saying you know, there's 100 there's 100 or more this one's saying that there are 50 at this time Let's keep scrolling down. What else are they saying about the Maroons in Grenada? It's a very little known history in the Maroons in the Grenada. No one really talks about them that much. Oh, so December 3rd, 1767. I have the honor to inform your lordship that some time ago, some time again, two slaves, Negro men named Philip and Piquette, belonging to uh, Mr. Le Chancelier, Mr. Chancellerie. A planter in this island were condemned to be hanged for the murder of the two carpenters named Dennis Bray and Matthew Brown. But before the sentence was put into execution, some very strong representations of their innocence having been made of me in favorable circumstances reported I was induced to respite them agreeably. Uh, uh, to, to the power vested in me, and then he goes, so let me skip this part right here, but they go on to say the sentiments of those who have impartially and attentively examined into all the facts circumstances which have been latter latterly and unexpectedly discovered that these two slaves were really not concerned in the murder so those two that they were about to execute were not really concerned anymore but that some of the maroon slaves named pompey bartholomew jack sulpice lamar and saint vincent of who the three first have been since killed actually committed the dead through certain uh, abominable and revengeful investigation and therefore these unhappy wretches have blank suffered a very long and severe imprisonment and cannot but earnestly desire your lordship so maroons these maroons were involved in the killing of these two individuals all right now that's the end of co1 CO101 slash 2. Let's go look, take a look at CO101 slash 4. This is the one that started off with the French document. This is uh, a couple of years later in December of 1770. Apparently, the Maroons are still out there. They're talking about rebellions in Tobago. They're talking about putting putting up garrisons in Karakou. Um, they're talking about rebellion. A rebellion of the black Caribs in St. Vincent. And so they're really starting to, the, the British colonial government here in Grenada is really starting to get a little worried. And Grenada is a part of this worry that they're having. Uh, this one's talking about, oh, this is Grenada. As the events are usually magnified, are usually magnified by exports, it seems to me not impossible. But some accounts may have reached England of His Majesty's colony of Tobago. All right, so they're talking about the insurrection in Tobago here. Let's sc scroll down a little bit. On Tuesday, the 23rd, Mr. Brown, Mr. Campbell, yeah, yeah, two other persons and myself uh, were returning to Mr. Campbell's through Crenby about 8 of the clock at night, about 8 o'clock at night, <laughs> or rather earlier, and they fired at us from the house as we were coming up to it. But they immediately fled, and we, not having Negroes to pursue them, they escaped. We, however, got their ammunition, booty, and one of them landed something, has been wounded. All right, so they attacked. They were attacking the planters now. They were engaging in warfare, man. These Maroons in, in Grenada were... Hmm. Uh, the account of the Negroes supposed to have been in insurrection... So these are Sandy belonging to the Hall to guilt uh, the first proper and chief of all. Sir William Young's three of their capital fellows, Mr. Kennedy's two of them principals. Uh, and then they go on talking about the people involved. Taken, Mr. Brown, two of whom were executed. Sir William Young's killed. Uh, Mr. Melvin's taken by Brunswick and Tom Cloud. And Tom Cloud, Cloud, and that's my mom's maiden name. They took one there. So that looks like somebody that had a connection to my family. Uh, let's see. 
Now they're talking about here, this, this December 6, 1770, sending all these these companies of troops and all these different islands and spreading them all out to help quell these rebellions. See, as the British continued to increase their imports after 1763, what did they, what did they think was going to happen? They thought that black people were just going to get imported from Africa and just sit around and just let abuse happen to them. No, there's all this warfare going on all over the Caribbean in the 1770s, in 1760s and 70s because, because, because of what they have created. This is this French letter is yeah. This is the Maroonies, more than a hundred of them. This is in so this looks like the in December of 1770. The according to this French letter here, see in Saint Andrews, there's still more than a hundred Maroons that were that were present. So this is clear that uh, the Maroon population, according to some, was still growing now. December 16th, 1770, it says, And am now to inform your lordship, in addition to that, the consternation occasioned in, in the quarter of St. Andrew by the maroon or fugitive slaves, having increased according to the enclosed extract of a letter and deposition, I thought it proper to take advice from His Majesty's counsel thereon, and in consequence of, of it, have sent three days ago uh, to the assistance of the inhabitants an officer in command of 20 men, which was very utmost, could be sent from the garrison and learning but part of most necessary centuries. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. So they're still talking about... All right, December 11th. Under these circumstances, I take the liberty of con conveying to Your Excellency the deposition of Mr. Piquetty, or Piquetti, an inhabitant of, the, of this parish. What parish are they in? I think, I think they're still in uh, St. Andrews. Uh, and further to inform Your Excellency that Mr. Sabolonundui, I don't know how to say that, had a similar conversation with these rebels on Saturday last with this addition that there were six parties in the woods, equally strong, resolute, that they would not give the inhabitants the trouble of pursuing them in the woods, for they were ready on the slightest summon to come out to any pasture on part of the king's high road to give them battle. Hmm. Mr. Rocher and myself have sent for Mr. Sangnang of St. David to take his deposition concerning the declaration of the faithful old slave who required him to admonish the white inhabitants to provide against the attempts which was agitated by the slaves to be made on Christmas Day. These insinuations and general intercourse between those who yet remain faithful and the runaway slaves and the unruly and turbulent disposition which of late has appeared on some neighboring estates indicate no less than a general insurrection if very speedy methods are not taken to suppress it. So they are also, they're saying here that the blacks on the plantations are communicating with the maroons in the woods and that there looks to be a general insurrection taking place around December of 1770 in Grenada. This one talks about a Julian, a free mulatto who was greatly disposed, or I think I was supposed to say disclosed, and uh, being at dinner in the house of the said Julian between the hour of one and two, one of the children came running and telling his mother that the runaway Negroes were coming, and that this deponent, greatly alarmed, expressed his fears to this Julian and desired to be accommodated in a separate chamber that the runaway Negroes entered the house and saluted the said Julian, who was lying on his bed, and perceiving the deponent pressed against the door of the room where he was, led him out into the gallery where they, inf where they formed a circle round him, and after several questions concerning his country, his profession, and his connection with the detachment at length, declared that they had attacked Mr. Bardeneth and plundered his plantation because the said Bardeneth had employed them for the space of six or seven months, cutting his woods, planting his coffee, picking his coffee, and doing other necessary off offices. Wait. Necessary offices of the plantation, for which services he promised them 100 Johannesons, that he had given them in part payment a hog's head of salt fish and a blank of rice and promised the remain blank out of his crop, 
When completed, they had waited the event and were told he would not pay them. But with the musket, but with his musket, oh snap. So he said he was going to pay them. They did all the work and this man didn't pay them. This mar So these maroons, sometimes you would find maroons would actually find work. Um, they'd escape into the woods for such a, for an extended period of time. But then, you know, sometimes you know, they, they can't only live their life uh, sustaining themselves, growing their own food and all that stuff. So sometimes they would get jobs outside of uh, living in the woods. And that's what this maroon apparently did. And they were promised to get paid by somebody, and they never did. This guy said he would pay them with his musket. They further required this deponent to to go to Mr. Rocher and to tell him that they were in blank expedition to the assistance of two blank parties commanded by Mirar Confess, that if he did not relinquish his intention of attacking and pursue them, they would come down and blank all his estate, I think it said burn all his estate, and that they would blank do it in a dark clandestine manner, but with daylight, with drums beating and shells blowing, that they were ready to meet and fight the detachment in the King's High Road, that in, in a very short time, the island of Grenada would be overturned, and many more such rebellions and insolent declarations. Dang, these Grenadians were about their life back then. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. January 1st, 19, 1771. Uh, they're talking about Picari. The guy again. Um, it said a detachment to assist the inhabitants of the court of St. Andrews upon the supposition of the danger from the maroon slaves having become more serious as beings so strongly assorted to, to be such. Yet I thought here was nothing to be dreaded from the outrages of these mountaineers which ought to affect the credit of the island if they measure concerted for the repressing of the several parishes they were not only driven to disperse and hide themselves their usual retreats and lurking place but a ringleader killed some taken and most of their plunder recovered which it is said proves to be chief, chiefly prohibited french goods in short my lord the marooners or the blank of the marooners the representation of a general insurrection of the slaves being introduced and the burning of the town of St. Andrew with the neighboring plantation appear now to have been so many blank or exaggerations, partly indeed. So they're saying it was a real threat at one point. Now it, it seems to be uh, it seems to have been minimized by January of 1771. And now the people that are still making a big fuss out of it are exaggerating for their own political purposes. Uh, let's see. Slaves have been found throughout the island and even more quietness than in usual in holiday time. That perfect tranquility with respect to the maroons has been restored. Or maybe some of the people that are saying that it's not a big deal are also saying that for their own political purposes. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, 1771 seems to be pretty much the end of... Yeah, it says here, the marooners who received a, a severe check on their late excursions. This is the 20th of January, 1771. So there was really not much more records of serious maroon activity in Grenada after 1771. So between 1765 and 1771, you have uh, maroon activity. You have them killing some planters, uh, carpenters, I should say. You have them attacking planters, attacking plantations, raiding plantations of money, goods, all kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Now, let's go take our trip into the woods of Grenada and let's see how these maroons actually lived. Let's see the trails that they paved. Let's see the mountains that they engaged in warfare from. Let's go to Grenada, St. Andrews Parish, Granatang Rainforest. Right now we are starting on our Granatang nature walk. We are gonna visit the area in which we got lost. How many years ago? Eight years ago. We got lost in the woods. We got lost in this jungle, in the rainforest. Overnight. Overnight. And we had to spend the night in the woods. Uh, but this is also a location where there's a lot of history here with maroon communities of Grenada, 1763 to 1771, as well as the Fedon Rebellion and the Fadong camp. So we're gonna go visit Mount Kwakwa, which is where a lot of the maroon activity was waged from. And we're also gonna visit uh, 
Fedon's camp. Fedon. All right, so. Bye. Here you are, it says, scientists to Mount Kwakwa. To Mount Kwakwa and Concord Falls. Hunting is prohibited. Ready for this? Ready. Let's do this. This. We can do this. We're, gonna we're not get, gonna get lost this time. Yeah, we're gonna get this. We're gonna get this done. <laughs> All right. Like true um, descendants of the maroons. Yes, we're tr like true maroons. That's yes. what we're gonna do. Yes. Let's do this. Yes. <laughs> so the trail starts off really groomed, right? It's really clear, it's easy to know where you're following. But as it goes on, the, the reason why we got lost last time was because there wasn't really a clear trail once you start going towards Concord Falls. But so far, so good. The trail down here takes you to Granitan Lake. You can see it out there in the distance. That's where all the fresh water comes from. Right? How are you feeling? I'm feeling okay still. So. Ah. Now, <laughs> let's see how It's getting that steep along. now. Let's see how this goes. I think I, I think you got this. Well, I know I'm starting to sweat. I'm starting. I'm starting to sweat right now. I'm out of breath. Actually. Yeah. And we just got and we just got started. Yeah. We've only been in here like this is what you call a mountain ridge. You got steep precipice on this side. You got the ground we're walking on, and you got the steep precipice on the other side. All right, so we can't slip either way. We got, if we're gonna slip, you gotta slip forward or backwards. <laughs> and then we walk along this trail. Right, Ola? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> we can do it. See, now we got. We shall do it. Yes. Here's a steep, steep climb back up. The mountain ridge is a lot of ups and downs, ups and downs. I'm not going to be able to capture everything because my battery will die. But this is the type of thing we're dealing with here. So we got to climb up. Serious thing. This type of thing here. Viewers, I probably should, yeah, turn on my camera at this point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're getting higher, higher, y'all. There is Granitang Lake. <laughs> As we drift farther and farther away from it. We still got a long ways to go. <laughs> See, this is where this is this is the easy part though, because this is an actual trail. Huh. Once we start heading towards Concord Falls and the area in which we got lost, we're trying to not trying to completely relive the moment, yeah. but to a certain degree we are. But once we get to that area, that's when it becomes more treacherous, and that is when it's kind of hard to detect what's a trail and what's not. But you gotta pay close attention because. After we got lost in the jungle eight years ago, they put up some ribbons on some trees so you can identify which way to go. We're getting higher and higher mm -hmm. up on the mountain. Then look at the mist. We're in the clouds. <laughs> wow. Look at that. Ha <laughs> ha. 
All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, see ya. Wow, look at that. Crazy. You got a picture Dude. of it, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm recording. Well, let me get a picture. Look how narrow this trail is. Look at that. Look at that. Look at my feet. This side, you're falling off. On this side, you're falling off. <laughs> I'm not falling off. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Sheesh. Over there. Yeah, so we went, we just went all the way down yeah. these ridges. Wow. All the way down, all the way down there in the distance. Mm -hmm. It's great. Look at this. Nope, not yet. Nope, not yet. Nope, <laughs> not yet. Oh. Nope. That's, nope. Look at that. Whew. That's what we gotta go through. You'll survive. <laughs> you will survive. Short, look. All right, look, do you see that right there? That's what we're doing. We have to do a lot of these steep climbs, but we're gonna do it, right? We will do it. We will do it. <laughs> Let's get the show on the road. First, we're gonna take a little breather before we hype up this, hike up this truck here, but we got this. Right? We got it. <laughs> there you are. This makes you want to whisper. <laughs> <laughs> the story. We are almost at Mount Kwakwa. We've been marching for like what, an hour? An hour. Yeah, about an hour now. As you can see, I'm soaking wet, sweat. But it feels good up here. It's like the, the breeze is like amazing. And uh, you can feel like the mist from the clouds and everything. So it's nice. What's the highest mountain point? This Mount Kwakwa is the second highest or the yeah. highest? I think it's the second highest. Um, Mount St. Catherine is the highest. Okay. And then, what is it, like 1,900 feet or something like that? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Don't quote me. Yeah, yeah. Do real fact check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here is the famous two Concord Falls sign. Whoa. So, this is where we decided in 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go to the, let's go to Concord Falls, thinking it's only an hour and a half to get there. Mm -hmm. Boy, were we wrong. <laughs> we got stuck in the middle of the night, and we had to spend the night out there. What Ooh. the hell was that? Oh, uh, um, hummingbird. That is not a bird. A beetle. Maybe. That was a that was a bug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sheesh! Uh, if you confuse, if you confuse a bug for a bird. <laughs> Then you know you're in the middle of the jungle. 
Oh my goodness. Jeez. He's some kind of animal. I it, it was, quite... Yeah, it was something. Yeah. We disturbed him. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to continue to Mount Kwakwa. And then, depending on how treacherous the Fidon Trail looks, mm -hmm. we'll make that decision then. But then we might just come back this way and go to Concord Falls. Yeah. All right. Peace. Wait, see, this is the trail we've been walking on from down there by Granitang Lake to Mount Kwa Kwa this way. But if you look at the trail to Concord Falls, it already starts off <laughs> a little sketchy. Yeah. Look at this. It's basically not a trail. It's, it's, it's really. basically not a trail. And then it gets worse as you go in. Mm -hmm. Thinking sometimes, uh, sometimes it clears up a little bit, but it, for the most part, this is what you're dealing with here. So, you can understand why we kind of got a little bit lost. We didn't get lost. But we got, we, we fell off track and the sun went down on us. Mm -hmm. And then we found our, eventually found our way back on track. Yeah. And by then people came to rescue us. But we would have found our way out. We, we were well, yeah, yeah, we were well on yeah. our way out. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the tippy top right there. I, I took my YouTube thumbnail picture or whatever. Profile picture. Look at that. We are here at the top of Mount Kwa Kwa. This is the, the big gold rock here. My cousin and I smell, smell marijuana. So somebody must be up here. Um, but, we, but there's nobody. Maybe it's the ancestors. <laughs> and then I don't know who in their right mind. There's a trail that goes to the back side of this stone here. Tang National Park. We just mount. We just climbed up about an hour and a half up to Mount Kwakwa. All right. So this is Mount Kwakwa. Um, this is, has a lot of rich Grenadian history associated with it. So if you go all the way back to the year 1763, Grenada was ceded to the British from the French. Once the British came and took over this island, they started to import a massive amount of Africans into the colony. As soon as they started to import a massive amount of Africans, they started to obviously flee. No one wants to be enslaved. So the people that fled up into the mountains were known as Maroons. And so there was a relatively large Maroon community in Grenada from about 1765 until about 1771. And these Maroons, if you look at the primary sources and people like uh, Governor Robert Melville, who was actually the governor of the ceded islands in total, he talked a lot in his correspondences about this maroon community that was causing depredations on the plantations and things like that. And so I think in 1767 and then in 1770, 
these maroons had killed some of the white planters on the island and so they really started to take severe action towards these maroons but one of the places that the maroons used to operate from was from this area here the, they say the, uh, the vast majority of the Africans that were imported into Grenada during this time period mostly came from southeast Nigeria, being Igbo, but a large portion of them actually came from the Gold Coast. That, that would have made them Akan or Ashanti. And this is where our ancestors come from, uh, me and Olabisi here. And so this is, um, and they even say, I, I, was, I was reading, um, I think it was Curtis Jacobs' work, and he said Mount Kwa Kwa. Kwa is actually, it's an Akan word that means forest or something like that. But this is an area in which they actually engage in a lot of activity. And you can see a lot of these trails that you see here were created by the Maroons themselves. All right. Now, obviously, some of these trails have been groomed a little bit to the point where now they've, they've provided steps and stuff. But back in those days, these Maroons, these Africans, found these paths on their own to the tops of the mountains, through the tops of these mountain ridges to be able to escape slavery and find themselves freedom up here in these mountains all right and this would have been a strategic location for any european the british or even french planter coming up to try to retrieve their enslaved peoples this would have been a very strategic strategic location for people to try to uh you know fight off those who are trying to capture now we call them abby yeah <laughs> all right so now after we're going up to mount kwakwa we're going to officially take our trip to towards Concord Falls in the area in which we got lost in 2014. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> Deep breaths. <sighs> Get ready to go through the jungle. The real jungle. <laughs> the land with no trail. Oh my gosh. This is, this, I, I came back in here in 2018 and they cleared it up a little bit. But, but it looks like it's back to the way it was in 2014. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to turn off. I'm gonna have to turn off the camera here because there's no way I can hold this and do this trail at the same time. So once it gets a little bit less treacherous, yeah. I'll uh, I'll sign back in and, and I'll holler at y'all. Peace. Peace. Peace out. Wish us luck. So we're we're about 30 yards in maybe or less, and uh, this is what it starts to look like. Before we get to like the the river and we start to hear water. It's just a lot of just trees and bush and makeshift trails with a lot of mud. But uh, we've we've gotten past, I guess, the most undef un ungroomed part of the trail, which was back there behind us. But now we're uh, we're still. I think we we're gonna approach some of those places a little bit later. But right now you can kind of see where the path is going, so that's good enough. All right, it's still pretty muddy and everything but if you look like this is what we're like in the middle of the rain grenada rainforest these trails are what the maroons used to take these are the trails that fedon and his rebellion they used to take these paths a slave revolt it wasn't even really a slave revolt it was really like a it was just a revolt against the british empire but the enslaved people, as well as the free people of color, had everything to gain from allying themselves with one another. So they did. And uh, this, was a, this is in 1795. This is during the, in the area, in the time leading up to this point, you had the French Revolution in 1789. You had the Haitian Revolution in 1791. You had the Declaration of the Rights of Man, also 1789. You had Thomas Paine's uh, book, which is also something along the lines of a Declaration of the Rights of Man. So everybody's talking about the rights of man, rights of man, rights of man. Meanwhile, here in Grenada, you have 25,000 African people enslaved. What about their rights? So this is when Julian Fadon, who was also part of an underclass, being a French man of mixed ancestry, of really an Afri half French, half African, in a British territory, and having Catholic roots, he was also part of an underclass. So he was a slave owner at one time, but he, re he freed his slaves. 
in the in the time leading up to the rebellion so we can get some assistance so even though this might have been historians argue about whether the Fadan rebellion was an actual slave revolt or whether it was just a revolt like people just trying to gain freedom or these French people of French ancestry are trying to gain freedom from the British. I mean, it could be one and the same. It could be an independence movement. It could be an emancipation movement. Like in Haiti, they were one and the same. So that was what was going on here in Grenada. And all of these trails and these paths here have rich history associated with them because they found free spaces in places like this in the jungles of Grenada. Hey Chad, is this the, uh, is this the area where we got lost? Is this the fork in the road? Mm -hmm. The taking this trail up versus following this water trail down? <laughs> is this where we got lost in 2014? Nice. Cause if so, this clearly looks like the clear path going this way. <laughs> But maybe there was more trees and stuff in the way that made it didn't make it look so clearly defined. Yeah. But the kids went this way. Is that rain? Rain's coming. This, oh. this is just to show you guys. Guess which way is the trail? We'll play a game. Guess which way is the trail? Which way? And I'm playing this game because I'm trying to show you guys how we got lost in 2014. There's not much of a trail, not a clearly defined trail at least, in these woods. Now I have an idea of where the trail is, but I'm just trying to see if you guys can identify the trail. I believe the trail is this way. That's what we're going with. Let's see. But this is to show you guys how we actually got lost here in Grand Time rainforest in 2014 all right but uh yeah we're going to continue on we're looking for these little ribbons because in 2018 when we came through here they they put little ribbons on the trees every now and then so you know if you're on the right track or not so as long as we can keep finding we found about two or three ribbons so far so we know we're at least up to the last ribbon that we saw we were on the right path so we're just trying to make sure that we're still on the right path you can start here in water now, coming from the mountainside. So it comes from the lake and it seeps through the cracks of the mountain from different angles and then it starts to form into bigger, thicker and thicker streams and then it turns into waterfalls and it goes out and then it goes all the way and empty, empties out into the sea. So you can, hear, you can actually start to hear a little bit of water now if you listen closely. stupid uh, thing so listen listen closely to the water yeah the river is starting to form here but yeah we're uh we're getting we're making progress and we know we're on the right track yeah. all right we're getting getting mixed up with the water now there's a little bit of river flowing through. It's going to get bigger and bigger as we go. So, we're out here in Grand Rangatang National Park in Grenada, and uh, we're in the middle of the rainforest. We just went from uh, Mount Kwa, we climbed up Mount Kwa, Kwa took some pictures at the top, and now we're on the trail going from Mount Kwa, Kwa to Concord Falls. About a five, four or five hour trail, depending on how you do it. We might even be four hours. But uh, this is a, a very uh, interesting location because this is a place, like I've explained before, where the Maroons were hiding out in Grenada. It's also a place where a lot of the Africans in Fadon's Rebellion were also hiding out. This is a place where they made a lot of their attacks from. We are in St. Andrew's Parish, and this was the location in which the Fadon Rebellion was actually launched. Um, we had the, the Guave and the uh, Belvedere states, where a lot of your um, 
insurrection was taking place, the rebellion was taking place. And the Fadal Rebellion was essentially a rebellion to overthrow the British Empire in Grenada. And the enslaved Africans, about half of the enslaved population, participated in this rebellion. So it was a mixed free people of color, what they call Jean du Colère, and African rebellion. The, uh, the Africans that revolted, many of them, I would say, were actually coming from the Congo during this time period because if you look at the transatlantic slave trade database in the 1780s, a lot of the British, they started to increase their African imports from the Congo region, West Central African region. So the Congo were, were, were known during this time period for being very fierce warriors. And in fact, a lot of them were actually involved in a civil war in their own country leading up to this point. If you look at the Haitian Revolution, Many of the Africans that were imported into Haiti at the time, upward of 60% or so, were actually born in the Congo region of Africa. Right? So a lot of them would have been products of a civil war that was going on there and would have had a great degree of war veterans. They were war veterans. They had a great degree of war training. And so, same thing, one can, one can, be, one can argue, was happening here in Grenada. A lot of the Africans that were being imported into Grenada were also coming from the Congo region as well. So, they participated in this rebellion where they actually ended up taking over the entire island of Grenada from about March of 1795 till June of 1796 until the British started to block off certain areas to, to the point where the Africans as well as the free people of color could not receive food stuff in order to sustain themselves, right? Another thing, that one of the mistakes that they also made in the rebellion was the fact that a lot of the Africans, they started to burn down a lot of the plantations. But as they were burning down plantations and burning down these, these sugar plantations, they were also burning down a lot of the food crops with it. So they didn't have the food to sustain themselves during this time period. And a last thing that was happening during this time is that the, the British got smart. They realized they couldn't defeat the Africans on their own merit. So they started to import Africans specifically to fight against the Africans that were in rebellion. And they call this the West India Regiment. So from 1795 forward, the West, in this, the West India Regiment of Africans, mostly from the Gold Coast who were Ashanti or Akan, or the Kingdom of the Congo region, were imported specifically because those were the ones that were known notorious for being fierce warriors. And that was that, those were actually the ones that were that comprised of a large portion of the Africans that were being imported into Grenada during that time period uh, as enslaved peoples. So they were pretty much Africans fighting people very closely related to them, but because, and my, me and my cousin were talking about this earlier, because a lot of the Africans that were coming off of slave ships, they were straight from Africa, they didn't really have a pan-African identity yet. So as soon as you're getting take, taken off of a ship and some British colonial governor is saying, I'm going to purchase you in order to fight in my military, and then you can be given your freedom at the end of this, at the end of your service. Africans are thinking, okay, yeah, sure, what do I got to do? And they're doing it. The ones that had been here on plantations who had lived for, for years, some decades, if they made it that far, they had a pan-African identity. They realized this is the white man versus the black man. Those that were getting purchased straight off the ship that were employed under the West Indian Regiment, they didn't quite, not all of them quite had that pan-African identity yet. Even though you did have some mutinies, like in Dominica, and I think the year 1802, where the Africans said, F this, and we know you're not our ally, and they mutinied against their colonial overlords, per se. All right, but by 1796, they were able to quell this rebellion, but just because they quelled this rebellion didn't mean that what was going on here didn't make a real dent in the colonial system. A um, few years after this rebellion, and a few years after the Haitian Revolution, Haitian Revolution, the Africans got their freedom there, they eventually put a stop to the transatlantic slave trade. So they stopped importing Africans from the continent at that point. And then another series of slave rebellions in the British West Indies compelled the British Empire to eventually abolish slavery by 1834, and then abolish apprenticeship, which came four years after by 1838. So it seems as though we've come to a little bit of a dead end here. There is a steep waterfall. So it looks like we got a little off track. This is how it was when we, came, when we got lost the first time. We came to across a lot of these, and we had to find ways up the mountain to climb back down, but we're not doing that this time. We gotta find a safe way to go. So, we gotta probably have to march back a little bit this way and find out exactly where this trail 
goes. But this is definitely not it. <laughs> yeah. But we did, the first time we came, we did find ways down the sides of these precipices. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, we did. That was ridiculous. Yeah. All right, so we uh, came down, we went up the mountain to come back down the mountain to make it past that waterfall and precipice. And now we're at the other end of it, the bottom, the bottom of it here. That waterfall came from somewhere back there. And so now we made it beyond that point. So we're gonna keep on trekking. Good job, Ola BC. You got this. And we came all the way up there. And now we walked and slid and walked and slid and walked and slid our way all the way down to here. And now Ola BC is almost at the end. So this, take a break at this river. And we gotta continue our way. Yay! Tough. I made it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Any ribbons? Yeah, it's kind of hard to find our way through here, man. It's like it's it's a little guesswork. But you gotta go, you gotta find random ribbons on these trees to know you're going in the right direction. You gotta find these random rhythm, ri ribbon, ribbons on the trees to know if you're going in the right direction. But so far, we're doing all right. A few hiccups here and there, we got a little bit off track, but we found our way. All right, so now, trail's getting real treacherous now. You see this? Kevin's got to be very careful here because there's a trail. A trail here, precipice down here. All right? That's what we're dealing with now. Be very careful on the edge. You can slip off the edge right there and fall over. See that? Boom. At this point, we got to crawl down the hill. That's how steep it is. And that's how slippery it is. Go ahead, all the BC. Show them how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, on, I'm on my butt right now taking a break. But I'm going to continue. And we got to go all the way down there. Somewhere. Ribbon? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yay, yay, yay. Look at my cousin go. Look at that. I think it's steep. I'm barely standing here. See that? Yeah. The mosquitoes everywhere. But I'm going to make it. It's starting to rain. Put this phone away. We are now almost officially out of the woods. There are makeshift signs. There's a little bit of a concrete bridge here. There is a trash can. There are some garments or whatever that is hanging on a string. And there's a tiny little house we saw up on the hill over there somewhere. So we are we're almost there. We did. We went from Mount Kwakwa to here probably in th about three hours and 35 minutes. We got up to Mount Kwakwa in about an hour and a half. So we're making good progress. We're almost at Concord Falls. We are definitely very close. We have to walk to, through a little bit of farmland and then a little bit of a stretch of field. And then uh, we're at the, water, we're at the uh, touristy Concord Falls. Are you gonna jump into the waterfall? Yeah. Yeah? Hell yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> we didn't come all this way for nothing. For nothing, exactly. <laughs> we were all up in the mountains. 
We were all up in those mountains back there. This is where we spent the night, 2014. So we're pretty much, we're pretty much out of here, out of the woods. It's all smooth sailing from here. Bunch of, uh, like a nice little trail here. Smooth trail, flat ground for the most part. We'll cross over to some farmland. And then uh, you get to Concord Falls. And then we're there. We did it. We did it, right, Ola BC? We did it, right? Yeah. It's about almost 4 o'clock now. We started this hike at 10. So it's about a six hour, six hour journey. And we stopped a few times to take pictures and stuff. That's it, man. We out here. Huh? 5.3 miles? Yeah. Well, because as we've been going up and down precipices yeah. and sliding and falling and... Yeah. <laughs> 5.3 miles of this is like doing 10 miles. It hasn't been a straight 5.3 miles. It's been climbings and ups and downs and ins and outs. Someone's out here growing their food. We got some cabbage. Got some peppers over here. And something back there, I'm not sure exactly what that is. Looks like it might be, I wanna say sweet potato. The sweet potato would grow on the ground. It looks like a sweet potato leaf. I don't know what it is though. I think they might be growing. We are at the end of the trek. We made it. Civilization. We are now out of the forest. Oh, there's a cow. Mm -hmm. Mm. And there is Concord Falls. Whee! We survived, man. We survived. We're here. We're gonna relax, get something to eat, maybe jump in the waterfall. You gonna jump in the waterfall? Yeah, we are. We have to. That's all. There's Concord Falls. There's the people. There's the uh, little gift shop thing and all that stuff. Little restaurant and bar. Yeah. Hey, what's up? Hello. Yeah. Last time I was here, I heard there were people jumping from all the way up there. I used to jump from the run right next to right there on the side of that thing.